Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Miller, and welcome to this lecture on recent developments in Jainism. This lecture follows Paul Dundas's book, The Jains, pages 245 through 276. Pictured here on the title card, we see an image of contemporary Jains and their friends at the International School for Jain Studies. For those of you who are interested in getting to know contemporary Jainism, I highly recommend that you attend this school in India. It has both winter and summer programs, and it's easy to find in a quick Google search on the internet. It is founded by Shugan Jain, who runs it. And as you can see, there are many people from all over the world who join to learn about the, face, the basic teachings of the Jain tradition, as well as to go out and have some anthropological experiences in the Jain community, eating Jain food and vegetarian diet, visiting Jain temples, and getting to know various members of both the monastic and lay community in North India. We're going to be talking about contemporary Jainism in this particular lecture, and this is one manifestation of it. These are the Jains trying to share their culture with others. And indeed, many people have come to appreciate the Jain tradition, although if you ask most people if they know what it is and they haven't heard about it before, it's very unlikely that they would know anything about it. So I hope you will share this lecture series with your friends, with people who may be interested in the Jain tradition, other people in, interested in Hindu studies or Buddhist studies or yoga studies so that they can get a sense of this tradition, which is rich with a philosophical tradition of its own and that has contributed to all of these other various systems that people know a lot more about. So please do be sure to share this lecture series and I hope you enjoy this last lecture where we'll dive into contemporary Jainism, how Jainism came to be what it is today by looking at some of the fundamental figures and founders of various sects and movements within the Jain tradition, as well as looking at how Jains live and share their message in the world today. We'll look at the following topics. We're gonna to look at Lonka and the Stanakavasi and Terapanti sects. I've talked about these aniconic sects several times before in past lectures, We've briefly discussed them, but here we're gonna see more carefully how these sects were founded, starting with Lanka and going through to other major innovators within the Jain tradition. We're also gonna look at significant reformers of contemporary Jainism. So we'll come a little bit more into the present. And then finally, we'll end by looking at various aspects of the contemporary Jain diaspora. How have Jains moved around the world out of India and how are they sharing their tradition and integrating with cultures all around the world? As a brief overview, the closest translation that Dundas points out to the idea of reform or religious reform in Hindi and Gujarati is udar. This means to raise up or to hold up, right? So to use the word udar is to indicate a retrieval, as you see in the second bullet point, and a reactivation of basic doctrine, the basic doctrines of nonviolence, and renunciation. So for the Jains, these remain universal and central and critical doctrines within the Jain tradition, the idea of ahimsa and the idea to renounce the world or to renounce certain aspects of the world in favor of releasing your soul. These things are raised up, udar, reformed, and continually retrieved and reactivated and reintegrated into the various places where Jains live today all over the world, right? So for example, I spend a lot of time in Switzerland and the Jains who live there obviously don't live the same life that they live in India, but they do have various ways of integrating their Jain way of life into, into Swiss society with regard to food and the way they live their life and so on and so forth. They integrate culturally and they also maintain certain distinctions and practices of their own. This also involves, uh, the, the, the raising up the Udar also involves a rejection of what are considered to be degraded practices. So if there are things that sometimes seem outdated to Jains, right? A lot of Jains today will say ritual is outdated or it's, it's not scientific or it's, it doesn't need to be part of the tradition anymore. The most important thing is the ethics, right? They'll reject certain aspects of, that they find to be uh, degraded or outdated and they'll stop practicing them, right? Especially as they go into the diaspora and they start to integrate with other cultural societies outside of South Asia. We'll see a little bit how that works. This udar, right, the retrieval and reactivation as well as rejection of some practices has continually caused sectarian splits. Though as Dundas points out, it also points towards a critical vigor of Jainism that has allowed this tradition to remain relevant 
and important into the present. It's a small religious minority in the world, yet so powerful. And its teachings, when people hear about its teachings of nonviolence and renunciation, they get really excited about this. So we'll see how this vigor continues into the present. Uh, nevertheless, as Dundas reminds us, right, no true Jainism exists. These sectarian splits happen because there, there are differences in opinion on certain teachings and whether or not they're true or authentic, or if they're adhering to Jain doctrine or what certain teachers believe Jain do doctrine to be. Uh, nevertheless, there is no true Jainism that we can ultimately historically track and and identify, but there are debates within the Jain community about what that might be and what that true Jainism would be, right? So among the believers, we might say, among those who believe in the Jain tradition, who are living it every day, they have a commitment to some true or truer or more authentic form of Jainism, depending on which sect they are in. There's a really nice Jain sect diagram here to the right that Praveen Shah created for the Jain Study Center of North Carolina. And so you can see the basic sects. We've talked about these before. Uh, there's the Digambaras and the Shvetambaras, right? The Digambaras have no clothes. The Shvetambaras wear white clothes. And within them, there are those who will worship images, right, of Tirtankaras, the Murti Pujaks, and the non Murti Pujaks, those who reject image worship. And we're going to look a lot at, we've talked about the Murti Pujaka a bit in prior lectures. We're going to look at how the non Murti Pujaka. Uh, traditions develop, and more, most specifically within the Shvetambara sect. We looked at the Terapantis already, as you recall, within the Digambara tradition, the Terapantis, you know, the non murti Pujikas, worship not images, but they worship actual scriptures or texts. So that's a really interesting development in the Jain tradition. But now we're going to look more specifically at the non murti Pujikas, the Stanakavasis, and the Terapantis within the Shvetambara sect of the Jain tradition. So we'll begin with Lonka. Lonka lived in Gujarat in the 15th century. So we're on the west coast of India. And you recall that was a very important commercial center early on where the last council was held in Vallabhi and remained very important for Jain religiosity and culture for a very long time. And still to, this pre to the present, Gujarat is still a location with a lot of Jains. Lonka in 15th century Gujarat was a lay person, right? He was not a monk. He was not an ascetic right? Uh, he is the person to which the aniconic sects that we're talking about here trace their inspiration. Aniconic sects, again, being the non murti pujikas, those who do not worship images of the Tirtankaras, right? And they trace their, their inspiration to him because he was the one to, who first looked at Shvetambara scri uh, scriptures, so Jain texts, and within them, he didn't see much place for image worship, right? You recall this, I, this practice of image worship was, uh, was indeed historically something that developed from what we know later after Mahavira had passed, right? We have the earliest evidence around the second century BCE in Mathura of an actual image of a, of a, of a Tirtankara. So this happened a few hundred years after Mahavira had passed. And so when he looks back at the Shvetambara scriptures themselves, the earliest scriptures, he doesn't see much uh, place for image worship in them, right? Uh, he, he and others also agree that it's violent in the sense that you have to create these images out of stone. You have to create temples to house them, which creates violence. And this stuff isn't really mentioned that much in these early scriptures that Lonka is looking at. Instead, what he does is he reinterprets the monk, right? Or the ascetic, the cheya as the holy place or temple right? The Cheya becomes the holy place or temple, which is the monk. So instead of going to a place or to an image of a Tirtankara, you go to the ascetic, and it's the ascetic that you give your devotion to, who you ask questions of and give your service to. What's interesting about Lonka is that he's rejecting image worship, right? He's an iconic. We also know that during this time in North India, that the Muslims obviously had set their roots, their imperial roots, and had colonized the North and were having significant influence, as we saw, in tenuous and ambivalent relationships with the Jains. Lonka had contact with the Muslims, who were also an iconic. For example, you see here to the right from, this is an image from 2001. We know that, the, that Muslims, very generally speaking, are aniconic. They don't believe that you can see God in an image per se, right? That's why 
if you walk into any Muslim place of worship, you're not going to find images of Allah, right? But you are going to find the teachings in the Quran. They're going to be speaking about Allah, but you're not going to find images. And the most extreme forms of Islam, right? Terrorist Islam, like the Taliban, have gone around and destroyed images where they find religious images. One of the examples in the image to the right is the Buddhas of Bamiyan, which were destroyed by the, Tal the Taliban in 2001, right? So we know that Muslims, uh, generally speaking, are an iconic. That doesn't mean that Muslims destroy images. The extreme ones do, like the Taliban, but they just don't incorporate image worship into their tradition. And in North India, oftentimes, Muslims would destroy images of the Hindu gods as well as Jain Tirtankaras, right? Uh, and at other times, it would help rebuild them. But, but there was an overall theological belief that you do not worship images within, the, uh, within Islam, right? So Lonka had contact with this culture of this aniconic culture that did not see value or belief in the worship of images, which is interesting because he himself then rejected image worship after reading the Shvetambara scriptures. So we can see that there were multiple influences here, perhaps, that caused him to do so. A gacha was, was created around him. Remember, gacha is like a family of lays and ascetics that, uh, that work together to support the, the, the ongoing of the Jain teachings. The gacha is the family that, that organizes itself around the ascetic community. Uh, however, that gacha, the lonka gacha, is today at the fringes of Jain society. It's no longer a central gacha. However, its influence, importantly, remains very entirely relevant, and we'll see how the influence of Lonka carried through to other aniconic sects that still exist and still have a very powerful influence within Shvetambara circles all the way into the present. Lavaji in the 17th century split away from the Lonka Gacha. Okay, so Lavaji decided that he was going to split away, and he would create or would be the founder of what is known as the Stana Kavasis. The Stana Kavasis are one of two main non or aniconic sects within the Shvetambara tradition. The other one is Terapanti. We've talked about them a lot again, and we'll look at the Terapantis in a moment. But this is how the Stana Kavasis were founded. Lavaji was a member of the Lonka Gacha, right? Which today again is at the fringes, but at the time was important. And he left the Lonka Gacha and he promoted that Jain monks and ascetics should live within lodging houses that are ruined uh, or deserted buildings, right? So don't get too comfortable and, you know, only live in places that you don't have to build for yourself, that have already been created, that provide the basic shelter that you may need, right? These deserted or ruined buildings, but don't, don't make it too comfortable for yourself. And that's where the Stanakavasis got their name from. It evolved from the idea of Stanak, which meant and, and the verbal root vas, which means to dwell or live. So stanak and vas living or dwelling in lodging houses. So they would go to these abandoned buildings and they would, they would practice their ascetic practices there and teach Jain teachings there. Lavaji was also famous for reintroducing the mupati, the mouth cover that you see this ascetic wearing here for the practice of nonviolence. So you watch what you say, you don't breathe in insects and so on and so forth. And so he's increasing the ascetic practice, right? There's always seems to be a little bit of a feeling of backsliding because people aren't trying hard enough. And then someone comes on and reforms the tradition again to make it more difficult, right? To make it harder for yourself. So you have to practice more austerity so you can burn away your karma. This is seen as being more authentically Jain, right? So the Stanakavasis were the first of the two aniconic sects within the Jain tradition and they remain relevant into the present. <clears throat> For example, Acharya Sushil Kumar, who lived from 1926 to 1994, was famous for becoming one of the first Jains in the diaspora. He left India, okay, which was not normal for a monk or an ascetic to do because remember they can't travel far because it creates violence. But as he's adapting to a globalized world, he came and he founded a sect of the Jain tradition in New Jersey. And if you're interested in learning more about how he did that and how he brought the teachings to America and how he brought the teachings really to the world, I highly recommend that you read Parveen Jain's book, An Introduction to Jain Philosophy, where in the first pages of that book, uh, Parveen Jain gives an account of Acharya Sushil Kumar's 
journey because Acharya Sushil Kumar was indeed his Acharya, his teacher. Very fascinating story about how Jain tradition begins to adapt into the global, uh, the globalized world that we live in and the diaspora starts to move out with teachers from the South Asian subcontinent. Okay, so those were the Stanakavasis, Lavaji founded them, right? Then we have the Terapantis. This is the second an iconic sect. Terra can mean either 13 or it can mean your. And so Terra Panti can mean the, the, the path, Panti means path, the path of the 13 or your path. 13 could refer to the 13 original disciples or ascetic practices that were used in this particular path or tradition of the Jain tradition. And if, if Terra is meant to mean your, it could mean referring back to Mahavira, your path, meaning we are returning to your path, Mahavira, your true otherworldly ascetic practices and path. And we'll see why that is in a moment. The Terapantis were established by Bhikshu. Bhikshu was a Stanakavasi. Okay, so we see sex breaking out from sex, breaking out from sex, right? So Bhikshu in the 18th century in Rajasthan uh, is amongst one of the best documented Jain reformers. And again, he came out of the Stanakavasis that he left because guess what? They were living too lax of a life, according to him. They weren't practicing the Jain tradition as authentically as possible or the best that they could. He wanted more austerity. He wanted more focus on releasing the soul from the world and disengaging from the world. He said that the ascetic community at the time within the Stanakavasis were too entangled with the lay people. So the lay people were waiting on them too much, providing too much for them, and also requiring them to give more attention rather than focusing on their ascetic practices. So he left and he created the Terra Pantis. He studied scriptures intensively during Chaturmas. As you'll recall, that's the four month monsoon season when most all of the ascetics would take up some form of lodging, right? But it was during that time that he started to realize that, that there's too much of an entanglement with the laity and we shouldn't be just sitting around with and, and being waited on all the time. And that's when he established the Terra Panti. And he's very famous for this all the way into this day. And you see his picture here to the right on a commemorative stamp from the government of India. As, government, as the government of India often does, it honors its religious leaders, especially historical religious leaders on stamps. And here you see a stamp from 2004 in India of Acharya Bhikshu. He is a big deal within the aniconic sects of the Jain tradition. Right, so he's also aniconic. He broke away from the Stanakavasis who are aniconic. So he retains that aniconic nature, but he adds an extra element to it by trying to disentangle the lives of the ascetics from the lives of the lay people. To do so, he distinguished two realms of value. One, Laukika, and two, Lokotara. Laukika refers to the worldly realm of value. This is the realm of the lay people, of the householder, those who are trying to get by in life, like you and I, to raise families, to have houses, to get degrees, to have jobs and careers, to be prosperous, right? The Laukika was those people, the worldly people who are not concerned with ascetic practice as much as the monks and nuns were, who are not concerned with achieving liberation in this world, and who are concerned with instead gaining meritorious good karma in order to have a good rebirth again in a future life, right? One of the things that is pointed out here by Dundas and by the Terapantis is that, and by Bhikshu, is that in trying to achieve karmic merit, the worldly people, the householders, <clears throat> would often do so by releasing animals, right? As something, I'm doing a good deed, I am releasing animals. Those in the local Tara, however, or those who, those who would be focused on otherworldly values were not trying to focus on gaining good karmic merit. Instead, they were concerned with exactly that, loko tara. Loka means the universe or the world, right? And utara means to cross over and beyond and out, to transcend the world. They were concerned with being otherworldly, releasing their soul from the world. So, those concerned with Lokotara were the ascetics, the monks and the nuns, those who were trying to burn their karma only through restraint 
the practice of ascetic tapas to raise heat within their body, to purify their souls and to achieve liberation, right? That's very different from interacting with the worldly householders, the laukika, who were concerned with getting good karmic merit. So Bhikshu wanted to distinguish these two realms of value to say that we ascetics, we are in the Lokotara. We are concerned with transcending this world and escaping this world of suffering. And we are ultimately trying to perfect nonviolence, as you see in the last bullet point, in order to purify our soul, not to rescue the world, for example, not to release animals, not to go out and save the world and get involved in worldly activities, even if they are good and nice things. Ultimately, a Jain ascetic has to overcome all action in the world, has to burn all karma, has to purify their soul. So he's restoring this distinction between the ascetic practice and the householder practice very firmly. And these are the Terapantis. The lineage has been maintained all the way into the present, right? Uh, and that's why it remains the, the two of the major Murti Pujika, or excuse me, uh, non Murti Pujika, image rejecting and iconic sex into the present. Uh, some of the primary and most recent leaders are listed here. We have Acharya Tulsi, who you see, who lived from 1914 to 1997. He's very famous for creating what was known as the Anuvrat movement, okay? So what the Anuvrat movement did, interestingly, is it took the lesser vows of the householders, which you will recall are the vows that all householders take that aren't as extreme as the ascetics, but are vows nonetheless to commit no violence, to not steal, and so on and so forth. That usually applied to Jain lay people, right? That's normal. We saw that before. However, with the Anuvrat movement, Acharya Tulsi, interestingly, took those vows on a global scale as universal vows that all householders, no matter what religious tradition, should engage themselves in. This is an interesting move because essentially what he's doing is he's bringing practices back to the worldly people, right? So he's re engaging with the world, with the with the Laukika, right? The thing that Bhikshu was trying to distinguish from. But he's doing this because at the time when he's, when he's, when he's establishing the Anuvrat movement in 1949, within the world, there's this movement for global peace, right? We're post-World War II now, post-Indian independence. The world is globalizing very quickly. And the Jains want to have their place in that globalizing message. And the Jain message is peace. How do we establish peace in the wake of World War II? Well, our contribution to that is the Anuvrat movement. And Acharya Tulsi really promoted world peace through a number of international institutions in order to encourage people worldwide to adopt nonviolence and so on as part of their daily lives. And it remains relevant into the present because people are still trying to practice these things, it, it, both within and outside of the Jain tradition, just householders, they still will be inspired by the Anuvrat movement. This has been carried forward, this legacy, by Acharya Mahapragnya, who you also see on the right here of Bhikshu, who lived from 1920 to 2010. Acharya Mahapragnya is famous for creating a system of yoga and meditation called Preksha Dhyana. With his great scriptural knowledge, Acharya Mahapragnya went back through Jain texts. As we recall from before, there were meditative practices in Jain texts in the medieval period and as well as some before that. Acharya Mahapragnya is responsible for going back into these texts, mining these texts, finding practices of yoga and creating a new system called Preksha Dhyan, insight meditation as you see here, that was based on fundamental Jain principles, ethics and, and meditation and yoga practices. He also, as if anyone has gone and taken a Preksha class, especially one of the asana or postural classes, has clearly linked up the Jain tradition with forms of Hatha yoga that it had previously not been linked up with. And so what Acharya Mahapragnya has given to the world is a new form of Jain yogic and meditative practice that is on the one hand based on ancient Jain scripture, but is also combining with the global transnational modern postural yoga movement. If you want to learn more about that, I highly recommend that you read Andrea Jain's book, Selling Yoga, which has a whole chapter about how Acharya Mahapragnya integrated Preksha Dhyan into the present, right? What's interesting about Preksha is it maintains a distinction between the Laukika and the Lokotara. The Laukika, the worldly people, will practice mostly those postural classes, right, to take care of their body from work. You know, it's nice to go to a yoga class and stretch out and de-stress and decompress. 
But there are, is another element of Preksha Dhyan that is intended to burn one's karma in the more advanced meditative stages that maintains space for the Lokottara, for those who want to purify their soul, realize their soul through this insight, through this Preksha Dhyana, and have that otherworldly transcendent experience. So really fascinating and really brilliant integration of Jainism past and present by Acharya Mahapragna. And today the tradition is carried forward by Acharya Mahashramana, who was born in 1962. And it continues to be relevant, as I said, into the present. I highly recommend that you look up, try to find a Preksha class nearby you. This is one of the easiest ways to get in touch with the Jain community through a way that would be meaningful to you to practice some postural yoga, maybe a little bit of meditation, and also to learn more about some basic aspects of the Jain tradition from a practical perspective. The Therapantis are quite influential in this way and quite helpful in this way. Okay, so now we're going to look at a little bit different of a social phenomenon, which is Srimad Rajachandra. While the Jains that we looked at so far were mainly part of the Shvetambara and iconic sects of the, of the Lonka Gacha and then the Stanakavasis and then the Terapantis, we're now turning our attention towards someone who was in, very much invested and inspired by Digambara sects or Digambara teachings. This was the Gujarati lay mystic Srimad Rajachandra, who you see pictured here in the image to the right, who is being bathed uh, with respect in all sorts of valuable substances and uh, is, is still respected all the way into the present moment. Good, uh, Srimad Rajachandra, born 1867, died in 1901. As you can see here, was quite an ascetic. You can see his ribs. This is a famous image of him that comes from a picture where he is very skinny, but it's because he has practiced his ascetic practices to the extreme, right? He's fasting. He's totally focused on the soul and having self-realization, seeing his jiva, having a perspe perspective on his self, his inherently blissful and omniscient self. He was inspired, of course, by Kunda Kunda, as you see in the first bullet point. If you recall from previous lectures, Kunda Kunda was a Digambara Jain who kind of threw everything else out in the sense that he said, first and foremost, we need to be concerned as ascetics or as, as Jains with having a direct experience of our soul. From that experience, everything else will come. So he really focused on uh, Sri Madhuraja Chandra, having focused on those very mystical teachings of Kunda Kunda himself, also uh, uh, taught these kind, of, uh, these kind of practices. But the thing is, is he remained a lay person. He was never initiated as a monk or a nun. And he's very well respected by lay people for this, right? Because he didn't have to leave the, the householder lifestyle necessarily or get initiated. He just did what he did. He just wanted to have an experience of the soul. Like Gandhi, he was part Jain and part Vaishnava, right? He had Jain influence and he had Vaishnava influence, Jain influence and Hindu influence. He was part of the merchant caste, as was Gandhi, that grew up <clears throat> in a milieu where these two religious traditions interacted and intermarried among one another. He was even considered to be, uh, by some, Gandhi's guru. Why? Because he told Mahatma Gandhi, when Gandhi was developing his spiritual practices and so forth, to follow the dietary restrictions of their merchant caste. He told him to maintain his vegetarianism, essentially. And so in addition to the other influences Gandhi had from the, the vegetarian society in London, as he traveled around the world and learned about vegetarianism, within India, Srimad Rajachandra reinforced this vegetarianism to Gandhi, and Gandhi remained a vegetarian, partially in, in a big way on account of Srimad Rajachandra's influence upon him. Because he was so mystical, because he was so focused on the self, because he was such an ascetic in terms of his practice, his austerities, his tapas, he rejected sects and rituals of the Jain tradition, right? So we have all these sects that we've been seeing break up and break apart. And we also have all these rituals that later developed in the Jain tradition. For Srimad Rajachandra, all of this was really not necessary. The only thing that mattered for him, just like Kunda Kunda, was to realize the self. So he didn't care about the ritual. He didn't care about the sects. He saw those things as outdated or outmoded or 
just degraded. And so he's all about the experience of the self. And in 1890, as you see here, he claimed to have that realization of the self. So 11 years before he passed away, he had that realization, had a great following and still does, as you can see in this image, up to this day. He's a saint within the Jain tradition for many Jains. Another important figure that's related to Sri Madhuraja Chandra is Kanji Swami. Kanji Swami lived from 1890 to 1980, and you see him pictured here to the right with Sri Madhuraja Chandra, now in that photograph I was telling you about, sitting in lotus posture in meditation, practicing his, his, his reflection on the self and his austerities, right? His meditation there. <clears throat> the most successful Jain movement of the 20th century, as Jain's, as, excuse me, as Dundas says, was the Kanji Swami Panth. So the path that was formed by Kanji Swami, who you see pictured here, was the most successful in the 20th century. Kanji Swami has an interesting story. He was orphaned in Gujarat, right? So a lot of this has happened, taking place in Gujarat. That's how he knows about uh, how he knows about Srimad Rajachandra. And he was orphaned in the, into a Stanakavasi family. He then became a monk within the Stanakavasi Shvetambara sect. Remember, Rajachandra is taking inspiration from the Digambara sect. He's taking inspiration from Kunda Kunda, and he's ultimately rejecting sects, right? So this is one of his great influences. And nevertheless, Kanji Swami himself is born into a Stanakavasi family and becomes a Stanakavasi monk. In 1921, however, just like Raja Chandra had, he discovered Kunda Kunda, the mystical Jain, who's totally focused just on the self and the mystical experience of the self. He also, of course, discovered the work of Raja Chandra. As you see, he's very inspired by him and came to the conclusion, though he was raised Stanakavasi, became a Stanakavasi monk, that the Digambara Jains had the true path, had the true Jain path. And it was a very mystical path. He then for a long time led a double life as a Stanakavasi monk, right? Because that's how he was initiated. But then he also considered himself a Digambara layperson, right? Because he wasn't initiated into as a Digambara monk, but he practiced as a Digambara layperson, just as Rajachandra had, right? He didn't get initiated either. And in 1934, he finally, after leaving this double identity, he had to make a choice. He threw down his mupati on the ground, the mouth covering that the Stanakavasis wore, and he became a Digambara layman, okay? He went from being a monk in the Stanakavasis to a Digambara layperson. So he finally made the choice, I'm gonna be a Digambara layperson. Although to this day, the Stanakavasis still claim him as one of their own, right? You, see, you can see him clothed here in the robes of the Stanakavasi to the right. Nevertheless, he had considered him to have left the Stanakavasis. He went and he hid in an old house at the edge of town. And so you see him here studying there. And while he was there, he studied the Jain scriptures and said that he discovered the true eternal Jainism through his study and his spiritual practice. What he said is that one must experience the soul first. Again, this is very mystical, right? Forget all the teachings and all the practices, other practices. The first and foremost, you must experience your soul, then you will be able to embrace the three jewels of Jainism, which is your recall are right faith, right knowledge, and right conduct. We talked about those in, in the first lecture. If you want to return to that, you can, but essentially like those basic teachings of the Jain tradition that everybody has to embrace to be a Jain as part of their Jain identity is something that emerges and will be embraced by the person after they experience their soul, right? So he says, Soul first, jewels second, three jewels second. And he established then the Kanji Swami Panth, okay? What's important about the Kanji Swami Panth and why it was so successful is that it was an all lay community, right? Where ascetics, although they could be part of it, were given no special status, right? You, just because you were ascetic, you didn't get any special treatment. It was for lay people to practice their asceticism and live the Jain way of life to the extent possible uh, in their householder lives, but the ascetics themselves were not given any special status within this system. In order to give himself authority, remember he was highly influenced by Kunda Kunda and Raja Chandra, who was also influenced by Kunda Kunda. He constructed a lineage, as we'll see, with Kunda Kunda. So he essentially put himself into the line of teachings that Kunda Kunda received from one of the Tirtankaras. How did that work? 
But it's a really nice mural of it here that you see. There's an image of this very popular mural, mural in India. And what essentially happened was that, okay, bullet point number one, that in the 10th century, there was a Digambara named Devasena, right? This is a, a, a famous Digambara named Devasena who claimed that Kunda Kunda, the great mystical Jain, right? Who was all about the self, <laughs> gained his knowledge from the Tirtankara Simandara, who you see pictured on the top left of this image, right? So Devasena said that Kunda Kunda gained his knowledge from Simandara. Well, in 1937, Kanji Swami claimed that he had a prior life experience with Kunda Kunda at Mahavideha, this celestial realm, where Simandara, who you see pictured here, the Tirtankara, was speaking. So Kanji Swami essentially said, in a prior life, he has one of these past life regressions that we keep hearing about, right? Not only in, in the Jain tradition, but in the Hindu tradition, and just in general, people sometimes have these past life regression experiences. Well, he says that he had one. He had this prior life experience with Kunda Kunda at Mahavideya, where Simandara was giving the teachings to Kunda Kunda, right? So what he's essentially doing is saying, I was there with him. And therefore, through these great lines of teachers from Simandara and Kunda Kunda and so forth, all the way down to me, I received these mystical teachings and I share them with the people. So this is a really nice mural because it conveys this really so beautifully. Up in the top left again, you see Simandara giving the teachings to Kunda Kunda and all those who are in the lineage with Kunda Kunda, the great mystic Digambara of the Jain tradition. And this cascade of teachings goes all the way down until it reaches Kanji Swami, who's sitting on the bottom right. And then from Kanji Swami's head, from his eyes, right, these teachings are cascading down to the lay people. Remember, this is an all lay tradition who are all respectfully listening and, and hearing these great teachings, which are a direct transmission, not only from Kunda Kunda, the great Digambara lay mystic, but also from Simandara, one of the Tirtankaras. And just to make it all pretty and, and wrap and tie it all up, you can see that there are celestial gods, goddesses, flying around, sprinkling their grace and their divine blessings onto everything that's happening in this picture, right? So you can see how an image like this and a story like this can place someone like Kanji Swami, who's so well respected, with even more respect because he's placing himself within, through this prior life experience, he's placing himself within the lineage of Simandra Kunda Kunda, the great Digambara mystic, and all those who have shared the teachings since then. And he is the one transmitting those teachings today to the people, right? And he lived until 1980. So this is a very recent, relatively recent development in the Jain tradition. So that's really looking a lot in the development of contemporary Jainism in, in South Asia and in India and how these teachings, especially in Gujarat, among the Shvetambaras and the Digambara lay people developed in all the way into the present, right? So those are some of the most, some of the, some of the most important lineages that still are practicing up to this day, right? Well, what happens then when the Jains go out into the diaspora, right? They start to spread around the world. And when did that happen? One of the first most significant instances is at the World Parliament of, or the Parliament of the World's Religions in 1893. Pictured here to the right, you see an image of five holy men from India who went and spoke at the Parliament of the World's Religion in America. They came from India to America to give lectures to the public about Indian religious traditions. And of course, the most famous of these, in the sense that this is the person we always hear about, is Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda is in the middle of this picture. He's often given credit for being the first person to share Hinduism on a mass scale with the West in America on American soil, right? In 1893 here at the Parliament of the World's Religions. He's also credited with bringing yoga to the world, right? The first teachings of yoga, he authored the book, which was a translation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra known as Raja Yoga, which you can still get to this day. So Vivekananda is very famous for that. But there were other people from India who showed up and are in this picture to the Parliament of the World's Religions. One of those people that I want to highlight here is Virchand Gandhi, whose picture you see to the far right. And I have put a box, a blue box around his name there to show you where he is. He's holding the umbrella and he's standing there. Virchand Gandhi was a highly educated Jain and he came all the way from India to speak about Jain tradition at the parliament of the world's religions. He was very well respected there, not only for his eloquence and his great teachings, 
but also for the fact that from a practical standpoint, despite the fact that there wasn't much in terms of food for him to eat in the American diet, he maintained his strict vegetarian Jane diet, which is even more restrictive than a regular vegetarian diet, even amidst the American cultural context and social context that he found himself in. And so we ha here we have Virchan Gandhi not only giving teachings that were highly respected, but also living an example of how one can maintain one's spiritual practice in a diasporic context. And indeed, all the way to this day, as Indians, or in the, not just Indians, but Jains have moved into the, the global diaspora where they've formed communities all around the world, they've had to adapt in various ways, right? And one of the key things that is often maintained, though not always, as we'll see, is a commitment to this nonviolent vegetarian and now increasingly vegan diet, right? It's, it's a demonstration of nonviolence, of self-control, and of, of cultural, uh, the, the uniqueness of the Jain culture and philosophical and religious tradition. Virchan Gandhi was the first to really do that, and that's how things have continued all over the world. In moving around the world, Jains have tried to respond to Western ideas, right, using their own philosophical and religious framework. One of the big examples of this is environmentalism. There's a whole field called Jainism and ecology that emerged uh, around the early 2000s that was publishing under the direction of people like Dr. Christopher Chapel at Loyola Marymount University, various philosophical positions from the Jain tradition and teachings and practices that were considered to be environmentally friendly. We can already imagine that the idea of nonviolence and vegetarian diet and these kinds of ways of interacting with the world would be environmentally friendly lifestyles or would lead one to live an environmentally friendly lifestyle. One of the ways that Jains have kind of gotten footing in Western society with these Western ideas was to integrate and share their teachings in light of all the environmental problems we're having, right? So for example, with food, a lot of the, one of the big things that's coming out now is that not only does dairy cause great harm to the animals in the dairy industry, right? The mothers and the calves and the males that are killed and it's just an awful situation, right? But this is also contributing to global climate emissions, right? The animal husbandry in general, especially of cattle, causes a lot of environmental problems, as do other forms of animal husbandry. Well, a lot of Jains realizing that, recognizing the violence towards the animals as well as towards the environment, as well as towards human health, have now become vegan as a result. There's a big Jain vegan movement that is happening in the UK and also now in America, where there are a lot of Jains converting to veganism as not a practice of environmentalism per se, but something that's grounded in nonviolence and therefore has a positive environmental impact. So Jains have brought these great teachings, not only about nonviolence, about other things like religious tolerance and religious pluralism that we've looked at before, to respond to problems that are happening in the West to give the West or to give globalized society now tools to think about the way that they interact with the world differently, right? And that's why it's so important and why I'm so inspired to share these Jane lectures with you because I think the Jane tradition really has a fundamentally important message to share with the world that needs to be heard, that most people have not heard of yet, but that should be, can, should be promulgated and, and shared uh, through multiple venues. So please do again, share these lectures with people, uh, let them know about the Jain tradition, share about nonviolence, have them read Jain philosophical texts and read them yourselves and see how you might get inspired. Okay, all that being said, <clears throat> although we have this very ideal Jainism of nonviolence, vegetarian diet, so on and so forth, on the ground, it doesn't always manifest as perfectly as we would like it to, right? So there were large migrations, for example, of Jains to East Africa for economic reasons. So from, from India to Africa, there were, of course, exchanges happening already for a long time in trade between Africa and India and the Middle East and so on and so forth. But more recently, when Jains moved to East Africa for economic reasons, to enter into the cultural context in terms of diet and all that, it became necessary actually for males to eat meat and sometimes even sell meat, okay? So this isn't something we typically think of with Jains. We think of them as vegetarians and vegans, but sometimes depending on the cultural context, you'll run into Jains who, for whatever reason, for whatever cultural context, don't adhere strictly to the Jain diet, for example, right? Now, this is a minority, of course, and most Jains are fully committed to a vegetarian or vegan diet, but I just wanna point out that 
in in human reality when real when when virtues and ideas and and idealism hits the ground right it creates this friction against reality not everything turns out exactly how we think it's going to be right so um, nonetheless uh, the, a lot of these Jains from East Africa moved to Britain in 1968 right where vegetarianism vegetarianism is reestablished and in 1982 they established the European Jain Samaj right so there's a big European group of Jains uh, the ones that I interact with more so than others are the ones in Switzerland because I spend a lot of time there. But you, you know, I can say that when I see Jains in Europe, you can see that they they are still maintaining a an identity and commitment to their Jain roots. Uh, they're very proud of their Jain roots, and in various ways, they're 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 plugging them in and sharing them within the European society that they're in through temples and through. Uh, bringing images of the Tirthankaras into Europe, right, for, for Jain worship and so on and so forth, creating communities, creating groups like the Jain vegans in the UK. And so the European Jain Samaj is a big group of Jains who have integrated within European society and yet share something very special again with the Western world to give it tools that it doesn't quite have yet, right? And this is the same in America. There's a group called JINA, the Jain Association in North America. And these are Jains that are united across North America to continue the Jain message, not only for themselves, but to share it with the world. And in the last slide here, so as we're thinking about who these Jains are that are moving around the world, the contemporary Jain diaspora, there are two basic categories of belief that Dundas points out that they maintain, right? One is many of them will commit to this new heterodoxy, right? And this is where things start to go a lot different than the way that we've described them in this lecture series so far. Suddenly, Jainism becomes theistic, right? Divinity is somehow added onto this. Jainism, as we know, in its, in its roots, does not have an ultimate God. There's only the self or the soul, and it's our responsibility to release the soul. But as it becomes heterodox, it transforms as it goes around the world, as it, as it also integrates with forms of Hinduism in the diaspora, right? Because the Jains and the Hindus tend to stick together in the diaspora. They are more open to the idea of, of some kind of God or the self being a God, right? Um, and yet a lot of their, their teachings are free from all the metaphysical complexity that we've gone through in these lectures so far about karma theory and so on and so forth. Uh, so the other thing they might believe is that the Ford makers themselves can intervene in human affairs. As we've seen, the original intention of puja was to, or one of the main intentions, was to look up to the Ford makers as examples of how we might live our lives to be better holy people and eventually achieve liberation. But in these heterodox Jain diasporic circles, some believe that the Ford makers can actually intervene in our lives, right? That's very much almost like a Hindu thing, that they can come into the world. But, you know, according to the more quote unquote, orthodox Jain tradition, the Tirtankaras, the Ford makers are beyond this world. They've released all concern and attachment for the world. They just look at it and they see it, they don't do anything. But in these heterodox circles, there's an idea that the Ford makers can actually do something for us, right? And there's also an increased worship alongside that of Hindu deities in the diaspora. So as I said before, it wouldn't be uncommon for a Jain, especially a heterodox Jain, to do some sort of devotion towards a Hindu deity for a particular reason, to Ganesha to remove obstacles or something to one of the goddesses for, for wealth and prosperity. We can see that, that the Jain tradition is in constant transformation, right? It may be reworking its fundamental commitments to, to the self and the soul in ways that are novel, right? But among the heterodox and among those who practice it, are seen as actually natural and, and either a natural development or that's just the way that things are, right? But we've seen in this lecture series that that would be a really big shift in perspective within the Jain tradition as it becomes more global. The second major category of belief that Dundas points out is neo-orthodoxy. So these are Jains who try to remain orthodox, try to remain committed to the orthodox principles of the Jain tradition without becoming heterodox or unorthodox or going away from the fundamental Jain principles. But there are new things that are added to it that try to make it integrate with the diasporic world, right? With the global world for the diaspora. They are more progressive. They will refer to science or the science of Jainism, right? They emphasize the rational aspects of Jainism. 
that accommodate Western thoughts, right? They try to get rid of the degraded, as I mentioned before, or outdated or outmoded practices that are seen as, uh, you know, antiquated or no longer relevant, right? They, um, they focus on a, a healthy diet, right? So Jane vegans, for example, would fit into this neo-orthodoxy, right? Showing that their vegetarianism or their veganism is, is a healthy diet because that's a global concern. It's not just a concern of the Jains, and yet it's part of their lifestyle already. What they're kind of doing is showcasing it as this is what we do. This is our orthodox practice, but this is how it integrates with other forms of discourse and practice around the world. So a healthy diet would be something that's uh, committed to nonviolence and yet part of a broader global discourse, right? They emphasize nonviolence, right? So they're still committed to nonviolence. They're still committed to relativism, anekantavada, as we saw in the last lecture, pluralism, allowing for religious tolerance and multiple perspectives to exist all at once. They like to emphasize that they have that fundamental principle within their tradition. They practice more meditation than has been practiced in a long time through, for example, preksha, Dhyan from Acharya Mahapragna. And they also, as I sh said before, emphasize how Jain, the Jain tradition is integrated with environmentalism or how it can be useful or helpful for addressing environmental issues that we're having in the contemporary period. And now even more so social justice issues as well, right? So the neo-Orthodox are committed to those fundamental Jain principles of nonviolence, relativism, uh, vegetarian diet and so on and so forth. But they're trying to integrate that in with a society that has a lot of other different perspectives like science, right? How do you, how do you, um, how do you reconcile science with some Jain belief that doesn't fit into a scientific framework or paradigm or can't be proven scientifically? Those are the aspects that the neo-Orthodox might not talk about too much and they'll focus more on the parts that can be proven like healthy diet and so on and so forth. So these are the two main groups. There are of course many others uh, that have arisen since then. And they the diaspora continues to produce new knowledge about the Jain tradition in publications such as the one you see here to the right, Jain Digest, which is from the Jain Association in North America, Jaina, and continue to try to remain and indeed do remain relevant into the present. This brings us to the end of this lecture series. I wanna thank you for watching it all the way through. I wanna thank you for learning about the Jain tradition. I really do hope that some aspect of this has inspired you to want to continue your Jain studies. There are an increasing number of places around the world and particularly in North America and Europe where this is possible. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any other scholar of Jainism who I'm sure will be happy to help you if you want to take your Jain studies onward. I want to thank you so much for listening and I ask again that you do please share this with as many people as possible and enjoy your Jane studies.